Ralph Ezzo, thank you so much for joining me at the Titans Nuclear Headquarters here My in Washington, D.C. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Where are invitation. you coming from? So we're I just traveled down from New Jersey, where okay. our headquarters is located in Newark. So that's right. Right on Amtrak, on time. Now you're CEO, president of PSEG. I mean, that's a big utility. Yes, yeah, so we're one of the hundred or so utilities who say we're among the ten largest. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And what? And so you come from New Jersey. That's where the headquarters is. Where do they? Where's the coverage? Oh, so from a point of view of regulated service territory, basically think of the New Jersey Turnpike, which is the north-south strip of the center of the state. But we have merchant power generation in states as far away as Hawaii wow. to as nearby as uh, Maryland. Okay, I'm going to ask you to get into that later because that's all, just a whole other concept. But before we do, I would love to learn just a little bit about you. What was it, uh, Columbia, that you did uh, mechanical engineering? That's right. That's so, my background, too. How did you get into mechanical engineering? Well, so I, I was a product of the Arab oil embargoes of the 70s, right? I could, in those days, you couldn't wait to get your driver's license. And I was really annoyed by the fact that once I got my driver's license, I spent 90% of my time waiting on gas lines. Oh, my God. So energy became a fascination for me. Okay. I've heard stories about this, waiting in the gas lines. It's kind of made its way into American mythology. I mean, but, like, what actually was it like? I mean, was this just going for a couple of weeks, a couple of years? Like, what was this? Oh, no. Well, it happened on two separate occasions, and it lasted for months. And it was uh, the way you got your gasoline is your license plate number had a number on it, obviously, at risk of being repetitious. And whether it was odd or even, you would match up with the date. And if it was an odd date, you'd an odd plate could get gas. It was not unusual to wait on gas lines for an hour, two hours at a shot. Okay, but this is no way for America to do business. No, no. It was a recognition that things needed to change. That led me to have an interest in mechanical engineering with an energy concentration, cool. which then led me to an interest in fusion energy research because fusion energy was viewed to be the savior of uh, getting us away from petroleum-based uh, and fossil-based fuels. And when you were interested in fusion, was that still Columbia? Yes, yeah, so, so Columbia had a, a small fusion reactor, uh, different regimes of, of physics uh, had different appeal at the time. And Columbia had a particularly unique set of operating conditions that were viewed to have high potential for commercial development. So I stayed there and then finished my degree and went to work at Princeton, which was in a different physics regime, but had leapfrogged ahead in terms of its proximity to commercial fusion. Um, leapfrog can be used loosely. We're not yeah, there yet. No, this was there, uh, uh, years ago. Well, actually, yes. Yeah, so, so Professor Lyman Spitzer in 1950 thought that commercial fusion was 20 years away. So we're... It, the, the, and as the, the joke the goal, goes, yeah, yeah, the goalpost keeps moving, <laughs> but it is certainly a noble pursuit. So how come uh, fusion was so much sexier than fission? How come, you know, your thought at the time was, and I just want to make, you know, normal nuclear reactors yeah, that yeah. change the world? Well, as you know, the nucleides that come out of fission have a longer half-life than mm -hmm. the nucleides that come out of fusion. So the byproduct of commercial fusion was typically deuterium and tritium, smash them together and you get uh, helium. So the, the high level waste uh, issue was non-existent. Now there would be activation that occurs in the device that would result in more of a low level waste issue, so a hundred year half-life. And was that the mentality at the time? It's that, uh, that nuclear fission was just dirty. So, you know, even though it was this incredibly powerful thing, three million times the energy density, clean air, we just didn't really like the waste that much? No, I don't, certainly none of us who were in fusion thought that fission was dirty at all. Uh, we did see deuterium as being more abundant than uh, uranium. Uh, and we did see it as having less of a high-level rad, rad waste problem. But no, I think anyone who was in fusion at the time, certainly uh, speaking for myself, thought that fission was a terrific technology that had an important role to play. Uh, but the sort of next generation of nuclear fuel, as you correctly pointed out, whatever nuclear reaction you have, the energy intensity of that dwarfs anything else it's that we amazing. see on the planet. Right? It's just amazing. The fact that we are not 100% we're not an 100% atomic society after having discovered it that many years ago. It's still yeah. mind-boggling right. to me. Well, I think that there were some unfulfilled promises in the early days of fission, right? Too cheap to meter. Didn't really happen until probably 10 or 15 years ago. Some of the capacity factors of the early fission plants were, were not all that attractive, 50%, 60%. It's only recently that the whole national fleet's been operating at north of 90% capacity factors. Really, was unheard <laughs> of forced outage rates in the past fractions of a percent. So I think that de delivering the nuclear promise in terms of low cost and efficient uh, really had arrived maybe a decade ago. Yeah. Uh, and then shale gas, of course, changed that calculation. Yeah. 
wow, that is kind of another way to look at history mm. is that there were these, while it always had the potential to be this incredibly cheap power source due to power plant things like maintenance right. and breakdowns, you still have this huge capital investment that if you're not running it and you got a lot of people working on it, it almost doesn't matter what your fuel source is if you can't keep it operating. Right. And that only changed kind of recently. That's Yeah, I, I would say that that's exactly right. And, and then, of course, as you know, uh, in the absence of the market or, and regulators as a proxy for the market, uh, putting a real price on the externalities that, that fossil fuel plants impose upon society, nuclear looks expensive relative to uh, natural gas nowadays, but if there were a price on carbon, I think that expensive look and feel would evaporate pretty quickly. When you were at Princeton, you were studying, what was it, like a magnetohydrology? Yeah. What was it? <laughs> yeah, so it was a resistive magnetohydrodynamics, which is a very long-winded way of saying, imagine the equations of fluid mechanics and imagine Maxwell's equations, electromagnetic equations, and then smash them together, and that's magnetohydrodynamics. It was an attempt to model the dynamics of a plasma, which is an ionized gas, using fluid mechanics equations, and it was a pretty good proxy. And then, you know, were you there for a postdoc? Were you there for work? How long did that yeah, come Yes, yeah, so I, I was there from 1981 to 1986. Uh, it, I think most people would think of it as a postdoc, although it wasn't called a postdoc. I was part of the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, which is a DOE laboratory mm. run by Princeton University. So I was not an employee of the university in the traditional sense that a postdoc would be. So we called ourselves research assistants, and I think I made it to research associate too or some such level. I was, I was on schedule, but uh, I then went to Washington for a year to work for the, who was then senator for, from New Jersey, Bill Bradley. Why? What drew you down? Uh, so the lab was constantly in this discussion over funding. Mm. Uh, is, is fusion 20 years away? Is it 30 years away? When are we going to achieve Q equals one, which was energy break even? And about the same time, President Ronald Reagan had announced his Star Wars initiative. Mm. And many physicists who I had grown to, to read about and, and admire, Sidney Drell at Stanford and others, injected themselves into this discussion about this is a great idea or this is a terrible mm. idea. So I began to realize that how important public policy was to funding fusion labs, deciding what our defense posture should be. So I wanted to learn more about it. So I spent a year in Washington as a congressional science fellow. It's good to get a real scientist in the mix. I mean, like it, so often these conversations, I feel like they're being had by people who don't, you know, have the fundamental grasp, and so they're subject to the whims of media opinion. But right. to have someone who actually was there that studied it at the at the highest level, that's an incredible resource for Congress. Well, and we were free, so that, <laughs> that made it particularly <laughs> desirable. Uh, yeah, now, you know, it was an eye-opening experience for me too, right? Because you quickly learn that uh, while we're brought, brought up to believe that two plus two is always four, uh, you can have two people from the same place having very different perspectives on what the proper policy direction is. So whether or not a strategic defense initiative or a Star Wars shield could work could be subject to scientific debate and scientific rigor, but whether or not it was a good idea really has less to do with the science and more to do with your view on social political dynamics about wow. what it meant to have a defensive weaponry that is almost impermeable and whether or not that therefore encourages a first strike mentality. That doesn't lend itself to scientific debate. That's really, a, as I said a second ago, a sociopolitical conversation. So uh, as a scientist, was that frustrating for you or is that just another type of science, like a brain science? Yeah, it's more the latter. And it really was, uh, as I said a moment ago, eye-opening for me that, oh my gosh, you know, the world doesn't just work. The two plus two is four all the time. So, so many of us in mechanical engineering grew up with Newtonian mechanics, right? So you give me the initial conditions, I have the equations, and I can predict the future without any question. Well, that simply isn't true, right? <laughs> I mean, human beings have a right to deviate from F equals MA or Maxwell's equations or a variety of other uh, parameters that we choose to be steered by. And so where did you take this newfound knowledge? So I went back to the lab then, determined to uh, uh, be guided by, okay, so what kind of research should we do that influences uh, the outcomes that public policy seems to be steering toward. And then I was at the lab for about six months and I realized that R&D, while vitally important, the time frames were longer than, than fit my personal satisfaction. Mm. And I was fortunate enough then at the time to be recruited to work at the office of the governor of New Jersey, who was Governor Tom Kane. So Bradley was a Democrat, kind of a centrist Democrat. 
Cain was a Republican, a centrist Republican, so I was not political. Yeah, New Jersey does that. They got the senator. They, have, they, right, so. <laughs> they do that a bit. So I went to work for him as a science policy advisor and got involved in environmental and energy issues. And what I, were the environmental and energy issues at the time? So I literally arrived in his office and three months later, my current company, uh, PSEG, had finished construction of a nuclear power plant called the Hope Creek Nuclear Power Plant, which was initiated with the expectation that it would cost $500 million to build. It cost $4.9 billion to build. What year did it finish? When was it, it was in 1986. Yeah, so finished. the highest interest rates possible. Highest interest rates possible. God. TMI, NRC reviewing standards, changing their point of view on uh, what the uh, design basis should be. Every conceivable thing that you would not want to see happen, happening. And on my lap, as a mature 27-year-old policy wonk who had a science background as well, what should... The board of public what what should the board of public facilities do about this thing that was 10 times more expensive so that 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 was an energy issue also at the time you may recall reduce reuse and recycle was big in the environmental world yeah and we had barges with solid waste floating going up and down the east coast mm. looking for a place to be disposed of so uh, the governor asked me and a few other people i shouldn't overstate my importance i reported to someone who reported to the governor to look at environmental consequences of, of excess development along coastal regions wow. so those were kind of the issues that were in play um so w what was the story then with the nuclear power plant so it was just being finished or yeah so for so fortunately unlike some other parts of the country uh, it did go into service as you know the shoreham nuclear plant for reasons having to do more with emergency response uh had this massive cost to build and then never had first fire. I know, I grew up on Long Island. It's a shame that we didn't get that. I mean, you think about how cheap the electricity could have been. And people are still paying for it now. And yeah. then, you know, there, were, there were concerns about whether or not if there were an issue, you could uh, move people to a safe location. Uh, but, it, but at Hope Creek, uh, it did go into service and the plant has been operating for 30 years and producing uh, relatively inexpensive electricity until the shale gas revolution came along. Um, but once the thing is built, right. Uh, and it's operating at these 90 plus percent capacity right. factors. It is still like the cheapest energy out there. I know shale is super cheap when right. the gas prices are low. Right. But when you look at like the long term horizon picture of any given power source, I mean, nuclear is still damn cheap. Right? So, you, so you have to, so typical national averages for nuclear power all in, right? So on a cash basis is about $28 a megawatt hour. It's just a little bit south of $30 a megawatt hour. If you take today's most efficient natural gas plant, it can run at a heat rate, which is an efficiency measure, of about 6,500 to 7,000 BTUs per kilowatt hour. What does that turn into be in terms of dollars? Yeah, so if you, if depends on your price of natural gas. If your natural gas is $2 an MMBTU, which is not unheard of today, that turns out to be $13 per megawatt hour compared yeah. to 28. Yeah. So it's quite a bit less expensive. Now, if natural gas is $3, then it's $21. If it's $4, then it's $28. Yeah. But now in both of those scenarios, I've not put a price on carbon. Natural gas emits about a half a ton of carbon per megawatt hour. The National Academy of Sciences says if you look at the impacts of climate change, yeah. they believe that the social impacts of carbon are worth about $40 a ton. So if you produce half a ton of carbon, then natural gas should be burdened by $20 per megawatt hour. Take any one of those numbers I just gave you, take the $13 per megawatt hour number, which was at a very low cost of natural gas, 13 plus 20 is 33. It's more expensive than nuclear. Yeah. But without that price being imposed upon natural gas, it looks less expensive. Yeah, for now. For now, right, 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 exactly. <laughs> well, that's, but that's the thing. I mean, I think that's the other thing that does not get valued fairly into nuclear is that these are very long-term stable assets. Correct. And there should be a price on volatility as well that's right. not factored. Right, so so uh, as you know, Secretary Perry has talked about the fact that we need on-site fuel capability. He has talked about coal in the same context as nuclear. And from that point of view, they are comparable. I think for those of us who are real worried about climate change, nuclear then separates from coal because it has both the on-site fuel capability and the carbon-free issue. We've had fairly normal winters the past few years, but each of those normal winters have had short periods of extreme coal. Yeah. And in each of those short periods of extreme coal, especially in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic region, 
this, the delivery capability of natural gas, the pipeline capability, is limited. Yeah. So we've had periods where we've had to switch to oil because we didn't have enough gas to feed our uh, retail customers, our heating customers. And sometimes you cannot get the oil in fast enough. You have, you have uh, <laughs> supply tanks, but once you run out of the oil in those supply tanks, which is typically a two or three day supply, then you have to get trucks in. And you simply cannot get trucks in fast enough mm -hmm. to supply the fuel needs of the backup uh, requirements of the, of, the, of the gas, what was a gas plant but that is now running on oil. So this notion that if that were a prolonged period of time is absolutely accurate. And you do need on-site fuel and the fuel diversity that's associated with coal and nuclear to mitigate the extreme demands on natural gas during a cold winter season. We're not an anti-natural gas company. I mean, we, we run natural gas plants. We just, we value the fuel diversity of nuclear and we value the low carbon impact. Of and you specifically, climate change is a big issue for you. It's a huge issue for us. And it's sort of maddening when you think about climate change. There's so many things we can do to mitigate against carbon emissions. But the two most important things we should be doing, we're not doing. We've talked about one of the most, one of those two most important things, which is preserving the existing nuclear fleet, right? Right now, if you just go head to head in the competitive power market, nuclear is losing to natural gas. It is crazy to lose those nuclear units, given that they are responsible for 60% of the carbon-free energy in this country today. And they're already built. You see what's going on down in the South, where they're spending $10 billion building new ones to throw away what would be the equivalent of a $10 billion asset. It would be asinine. It would be asinine. And then the other thing that we're doing, which is probably the, the most important thing that, that we ought to be doing, is energy efficiency. Yeah. I mean, energy efficiency is can actually reduce carbon at a negative marginal cost, right? Because to the extent that there's low-hanging fruit, incandescent lighting versus LED lighting, or old HVAC systems versus higher efficiency units, you can install technology in a customer premise, lower their bill, and have them use less energy, which is reducing the carbon impact on, on the planet. So, but yet we're obsessed with, with solar and offshore wind and a variety of things that are important, but are not at the price point that existing nuclear or energy efficiency around. And as someone who uh, manages, uh, <laughs> or who at least sees firsthand how a grid is managed, mm -hmm. maybe you can speak to uh, how uh, intermittent power sources, uh, as they increase in uh, percentage of the overall grid, affect the stability of the grid. Yeah, so, so we, it, it depends on the, the percentage penetration. It depends upon the customer mix. So there's no one size fits all. But the issue that you're referring to, Brett, is a very important one. Oftentimes, we will compare the bus bar cost of electricity coming from a nuclear plant or a gas plant or a coal plant versus wind or solar. But you have to recognize that the first three that I've mentioned are dispatchable. I can control when they operate. So their value to the grid is different than something that's non-dispatchable. I can't control when the wind blows or the sun shines. So to simply say that solar or wind is X, I really have to add to X well, what is the price associated with me being able to control that output, which really is battery storage. And I'm worried about not just the price, but the carbon price as well. If you if supply needs to match demand and you've got a power source where supply doesn't match demand, you've got to add something else to the system right. that allows to balance out that curve. But you can't not add the carbon footprint of that thing too. If right. we had like these giant battery uh, installations to get us through uh, a lull and uh, forget even a seasonal lull, just imagine like a, right. a weekly lull, you got to add the carbon footprint of that too. Right, you definitely do. And, and as you realize, both of these, whether it's uh, storage from batteries and, and, and then some renewable energy supply, these are capital intensive assets. The reason why we love renewables is that the fuel source is free. Whenever you have a capital intensive asset, the capacity factor is critical, right? You don't want something that you're spending a lot of money to build and it's only used 15% of the time, which is what's happening in a lot of jurisdictions that have gone all in on solar. And again, that's not an anti-solar message, but it does say, why would you go all in on solar and let your nuclear fleet retire? Germany. Why would you go all in on solar and not spend more money on energy efficiency? The United States writ large. So those are the things that we've been trying to say to people, that we want, first of all, to have a future where people use less energy than they, than they use today. Not because they're cold in their home or they're sweating in their home or because it's dimly lit, just because we change the hardware that they use now to more efficient hardware. Second, we should have a supply that's cleaner. That begins with preserving the current nuclear fleet 
looking at advanced nuclear technologies, whether that's SMR or different fuel cycles for the future, and renewable supply. Thirdly, now that we have a cleaner supply stack and people are using as little as they need to, maybe we can use this clean fuel, electricity, to do other things. Those other things primarily would be transportation. Right. Of course, transportation will be the number one source of carbon emissions in the country. Once you've done all of that, you better be investing in the grid. Because if you think people are cranky if they go two days without their phone, wait till they go two days without their car. Right. So, so that's the four things that we think should be done. Energy efficiency, cleaner supply, electrify the economy, and then invest in the grid for is value. Okay, hey, listen, it's a great plan, but that is a big message to get across to a lot of people. And uh, climate advocates have been trying their damn hardest, I guess, right. since like the 90s. Right. And still, I feel like the we haven't made enough progress. And the toll that we've been taking, even in these last 20 years, when we've known about it and been trying to communicate to the public, it's just adding up, adding up, adding up and getting worse. So are there new strategies on the horizon to communicate to people or is it just a matter of just hammer away, hammer away, hammer away at them? Well, I think a few years ago there wouldn't have been a podcast like this. So this is great and it's to your credit. I do think you're starting to see some changes in the way in which people are speaking about the path that we're on. And you do hear words like rapid decarbonization. You do hear incredibly reputable organizations like the Union, Union of Concerned Scientists saying, we need to make sure that the existing nuclear fleet is preserved and operates safely, of course, without question. Uh, and you do hear national environmental groups talking about the importance of preserving the existing nuclear fleet. So uh, we're, we're starting to recognize that one and a half degree C is probably a lost cause. Uh, can we keep it to under two degrees? Business as usual. I've seen some estimates might take us to three or four degrees C. That would be a disaster. I mean, but this is, I mean, even one and a half, which is probably lost cause, is essentially Armageddon at this point, which means do we need to be thinking about things just like in a radically different way? I'm not saying Green New Deal, we need to mobilize war efforts, but maybe think about technology instead of, it, like, I love efficiency. I think it makes amazing business sense, but efficiency can never actually reduce what we've already made to the air, which is doing the majority right. of warming. So maybe is it time to be thinking, ah, maybe we don't invest so much in, re in efficiency technologies and we invest more in moonshot technologies? So, so I think that there's a, an all the above approach, right? So every time we add, we just compound the, the situation. So our approach is to add less. But you're right, there are uh, attempts at extraction technologies. I'm not as knowledgeable about those as perhaps, uh, as I'm sure other people are, but there's no question that there's been talk about seeding the atmosphere with reflective particles and, and then removing carbon uh, and using the oceans as a sink for, for uh, calcified or uh, solidified carbon deposits. Uh, and then, of course, what I said a moment ago in terms of strengthening the grid is an adaptation technology. It just uses a foregone conclusion that we're going to have some intense storms that uh, we're going to have to learn how to deal with in terms of the, 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 the ability of the infrastructure to withstand those, those events. And then the other thing that I'm a little worried about is even if we get our act together in the U.S., the U.S. is only 15% of global right. emissions. And even, okay, so 15%, not nothing, but the world is going to grow past that 15% in less than a decade. Do you, do you meet with international utilities too? Like, do you get in a room with people and say, okay, like, you know, governments aside, let's let some, you know, private companies also talk about how we can be helping each other across the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. So the Edison Electric Institute, for example, participates in an international meeting uh, every other year. We'll be going to Japan this October, and this will be front and center a topic. I worry sometimes that this notion of the developing world and other nations may undo every bit of good that we do is a bit of a red herring. Because depending upon what metric you want to use, we are still the biggest contributor and will be the biggest contributor to global climate change and carbon loading, right? So uh, if you look at carbon emissions per capita, I mean, the United States dwarfs everyone. And I also think that we're, we could be missing an opportunity to the extent that we develop those carbon-free technologies here, that's an export opportunity for us in Absolutely. the future. You know, we're losing our competitive advantage in exporting uh, uh, nuclear technology. We're losing it to the Russians, we're losing it to the South Koreans. Uh, why? Why see that? I mean, it's, it, to me, it's a national security interest as well 
to, to maintain a strong position in terms of understanding that kind of technology. So you're the head honcho at the utility now, but on your rise there, did you was part of your role to look at some of these coming technologies to investigate um, from like more R&D perspective, what might be coming down the line, how utilities can incorporate them? Yeah, so my first role at this company was director of research and development. Now research and development at electric and gas utilities is a little different than the research and development at an AT&T Bell Labs. That's an understatement. It was very different, right? We, so I, I never came close to getting a Nobel Prize, and with all due respect for the many technically talented people that I oversaw, the, the, we didn't have a bunch of Nobel laureates there either. But we did have a battery energy storage technology center. And I, I deliberately said those words slowly because each of the first letters spells the word best. Uh, we did have solar panels that we would put on our own company facilities. New Jersey, which is where we tended to focus in those days, did not have the land mass for, for wind turbines, so we didn't do any research in that area. We did a lot of information technology research on how to better control the grid, the ability to flexibly redirect uh, power flows uh, through changing the impedances of the networks. So the, so, the, so the industry has always had an active interest in R&D, primarily in two ways. One was through something called the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, and another was through our original equipment manufacturers. So we had close relationships with the GEs, the Siemens, the ABBs of the world in guiding their uh, product development efforts. One thing I didn't hear, though, was energy entrepreneurs. How right. would an energy entrepreneur, I've seen like there's Greentown Labs up in Boston, mm -hmm. there's other hubs throughout uh, the country, where it's just like, you know, two guys in a garage, but you know what, maybe they do have a new airfoil design for a wind turbine right. that could really pay off. How would they get in touch with big utilities? How do they form partnerships? How did maybe they get some capital from you guys? Yeah, so the two ways that we ran into energy entrepreneurs was less on kind of capital intensive material science stuff and more on additive processes that we might not think about. So lubricants in some of our uh, moving parts, uh, diagnostic tools that would help us capture energy losses in our major plants. So s coatings that would improve the life expectancy of those turbine blades as opposed to a brand new material. So that was one area. Second was in information sciences. Uh, monitoring diagnostics and sensors that said, you may not realize it, but you're about to have an unplanned outage. And if you take the system down now, you can have a planned outage. So things, what, what is about to break will be what you will need to replace, but there won't be any uh, additional damage from that part breaking and then having to, to replace other things that would not have otherwise need to be replaced because of the damage it creates. So, so those are still real areas for energy, energy entrepreneurs, but I think the most exciting area for energy entrepreneurs going forward is in data analytics. Mm. We, uh, we are just beginning to now analyze our system from the customer usage with advanced metering all the way back to the power plant. And we've been so focused on causation and not spent much time on correlation that we're really in our infancy as an industry in terms of understanding all of the information that we're able to collect from, from that whole value chain and what it means for predictive maintenance, preventive maintenance, uh, customer uh, energy consumption, plant uh, operations and things of that nature. So I see how that can have some like real short-term value and make incredible business sense. Right. So it's no surprise to me that you guys are taking a look at that. But I still wonder, is there any, since what, you know, since what we need is a moonshot, if we're going to remove a thousand gigatons of CO2 from the air, if we're going to compensate for a growing uh, energy demand world, we need something not just, you know, just a little bit better than what we've got, not even just radically more efficient than what we've got, but we need something like uh, that provides a thousand times more energy than we've had before. Is there some way that the utilities can get together? I know you guys have EPRI, but specifically to be funding more moonshotty ideas, almost like a Google X or your Bell Labs example, but hosted by the utilities with access to the customers, right. with input from experts from around the world. Is there anything like that in the works or that could be in the works? So, there, so to my knowledge, there isn't anything like that that is in the works, but that certainly could be in the works. I think most of the industry is putting its moonshots, if you will, around advanced fuel cycles in nuclear mm. and allowing the market pull associated with policy subsidies to bend the cost curve on wind and solar, right? So you, you, if you just look at the size of 
wind turbines and how that's changed over the past few years. An area, though, that I think could be worth exploring was whether or not we shouldn't learn some things from biology mm. that could change the way in which we uh, generate uh, 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 energy supplies. Please right? go on. I'd love to hear more about well, this. Well, I mean, you know, Mother Nature just seems to figure out things far in advance of us, right? I mean, it wasn't uh, the, the turn of the 20th century when birds learned how to fly. They seem to know how to do that way before we did. And I see you have some plants here in your office. They Somehow are, converting light into they are uh, very yeah, efficient sequestering right, garbage. Right, yeah, right. right. Yeah. So, 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 are there biological processes that we don't fully understand that can be much more efficient at converting uh, uh, natural resources into energy supply? I'm not a biologist. I'm a mechanical engineer, as we talked about. So, I tend to think more about spinning things and turning things, and then having a brief foray into fusion. Uh, more about electromagnetic uh, 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 capabilities. The, 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 the issue is always going to be one of energy intensity. Mm. And, uh, and to my knowledge, whenever you look at physics, even if you compare biological processes to atomic processes, the energy intensity of the atomic process will always dwarf other things. That's right. So, so that, seems, that would be where I would put more emphasis and let others look at the biological area, partially out of my ignorance, but more out of the fact that uh, I still think you're going to get a lot more out of breaking atomic bonds than you will anything else. I couldn't agree more. Ralph, as we uh, wrap up here, maybe you could just give us your kind of like your personal take on, on why this is important. Uh, why is it beholden upon us to solve climate change? You, you know, uh, June 6th is going to be the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And I, my parents' generation was known as the greatest generation for personal sacrifices that they made that really changed the course of history. I'm a baby boomer. I hope our generation remains known as baby boomers. My fear that instead of being the greatest generation, we're going to be the greedy generation. Mm -hmm. When I think about the calamities we are setting up for our children and our grandchildren, whether it's the national debt or the environmental calamity that we're talking about, I just am I'm saddened by what, what, what we're leaving for future generations. I can't control the national debt except to vote during primary day and election day. But I feel like I've got an educational background that, could, uh, that enables me to do a lot more about climate change and the disaster that, we're, that is looming and trying to undo that so that maybe we can be the second greatest generation and not the greedy generation. Alpha, thank you so much for your time and for your work. My pleasure.